Ugh. What do you think we should work on today? Hey folks, welcome back. Yep, it's still here. The police bike. Uh, we're going to tear into it again too. And I'm going to go over the whole story with you here momentarily. So let's get right to it. First things first, I got to get some air going. I'll try to avoid turning the big fan on. Maybe I'll turn that AC over there, even though the door is open. It kind of blows some cool air on me. It's hotter than a $2 pistol today. Uh, hopefully the noise won't be too overwhelming. All right, folks. So, stop. So basically, basically, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you the whole story here. You saw in the previous videos, I don't know how many videos there were on this, two or three, whatever it was, that um, I, I just couldn't get a runner right. No matter what I did, it just would not run right. It just ran like crap. And so I talked to the owner about it, and um, I said, you know, we're going to have to turn to this more and more. And he said, well, I, I didn't have the money to do that. He, 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 didn't, he didn't say necessarily that way. He said he didn't want to sink the money into it, and he also indicated he had some other financial issues, and I'm not going to get into somebody else's personal financial stuff. I'm just kind of giving you generalities here, okay? This, this gentleman's a super nice guy, and I've said it once, and I'll say it again. My ultimate objective is to get this back to him without completely losing my shirt on it. i got to get something out of it, which is part of this story. I would love to see him back into this, all right? back Have this back in his life, basically. So... Uh, what, to explain the, the to explain the depth of what um, I thought you know he would be having to pay for, I'm gonna have to tell you right now what I believe the the causation is. Now, a viewer who said he was a motor officer riding these bikes, these J model, these J engine um, KZ1000 for like 12 years, said that these had a history of um, dropping. Um, he used the word dropping. I don't know what he means by that. Um, valve. Um, guides dropping valve guides where's my head today my brain yeah so and that's because the thing would be stone cold or certainly not heated up and then it would go into pursuit mode pursuit police 1000 and then it would get hot really quick and supposedly that's what would happen with them i haven't been able to really verify that but if there was a problem and i believe there is a problem in the valve guides not not necessarily that they moved or it's possible but that they're completely wore out on the intake in particular would explain everything. That would explain everything. You know, it does smoke a little bit when you first start it, okay? So that would also explain valve stem seals being an issue and the guides being worn and also the fact that you have so much oil in the cylinders. It may not just be rings. It may be both of them contributing to that oil situation. So we have oil in the cylinders we have um, vir virtually like hardly any vacuum impulse when the damn thing is running and I put the carb tune on them. Got new carb holders. I do not believe that these shafts are all that wore out, but we'll get to that here in a second. We're going to deal with these as well. And so I believe that what's the number one thing that's going on in this thing is, again, top end cylinder head mainly, and the valve guides are completely shot, the valve stem seals. The valve, you know, the, the, well, you, I guess you'd call them valve guide seals too, right? Because they go between the guides and the valve stems. And um, I think that's where you're getting all the leakage as far as air coming through. I think they're just completely shot. It could be that all of them on the intake side or some of them on the intake side are, um, are loose, the valve guides themselves. Um, and I looked online this morning. You can buy oversized one, like 2,000th oversized. I don't know how you prep that hole if you have to ream them out. I, I could do that. I could buy the reams and put it over on the mill. I can probably do all this stuff in-house. So I believe, I believe that um, this is the problem is in the valves, specifically the guides. It would explain everything on the intake side with all the other symptoms. And again, the oil in the cylinders, the fact that it smokes when it starts, and the fact that these carb shafts just are not that worn. We have a little play in them, yes. Now there are seals in here, and that's what I was getting to, before, what I'm gonna to get to now, what I alluded to before. I've ordered two um, kits that cover two BS34 carbs, because they're designed for an XX, XS650 with B34s, that um, it's a twin, so one kit, two carbs. I ordered two kits that are the 
I believe are the proper shaft seals, you said shaft, for these carburetors. I've also ordered new fuel T's, a uh, fuel T rather, and fuel joints um, that are metal that have the new O-rings because you can't buy those O-rings separately OEM. And what I'm gonna end up doing is, I'm gonna, I'll video all this, this will be a separate video. We'll pull these BS34's apart, we'll unrack them in other words, take them to bits. They've already been cleaned, I know they're really good, so that part will be minimal. And then we will take the butterflies out, we'll pull the shafts out, um, we'll check clearances. I don't know if there's any standard, but we'll, we'll figure out you know, some way to determine how much play is in there. And if they don't look too excessively egged out or something, we'll just put new seals in and put these things all back together with the new T's and the new O-rings so we have a, a nice patent uh, or patent fuel system and uh, then put it back in service. So that'll kind of exclude the carburetor shafts as a causation, you know, contributing to it. I, I believe it's up here. So that brings us back to the situation with the owner. Um, what happened was um, he said, when I told him, I said, I believe this thing just needs a top end job. Um, he said, well, he couldn't do that and just bring it back. And it, does it run? And I said, well, it runs okay, but not really okay. I mean, it the idle hangs. I said, it would be very uncomfortable to drive. And then some other things happened that he communicated to me. And, and I'm, again, I'm not going to get into his personal stuff. But ultimately, I made him an offer to buy this. Now, I did this a while back because I sensed that he was struggling with, with um, what to do about this. And again, he's a super nice guy. And I really wanted to get this thing back running perfectly for him. I really did. And I would have been happy to ship it back to him. I had it in the trailer, ready to go, all strapped down. And I've had it in there for the last, what, three weeks? And so I just took it out uh, 10 minutes ago and put it on the lift here and started filming. All right, so this is where we're at. And ultimately, he did accept my offer. And I got the title in the mail. I've done the title transfer. So this bike is now in my name. Now, I, I did not want a fourth motorcycle, and I certainly did not want a P21 or P22. This is P21, yes. He said it was an 03. This is an 02. So, you, I mean, you can, tell, you can tell the way it is, you know, the 21. P21, and uh, right after there is a 2. That's the 10th digit. That's um, 2002. So, anyway, this is a P21. I didn't want one. I didn't want, I'm, you know, these are interesting, but they're, you know, I didn't want a fourth bike. But the only way to get anything out of this was to buy it, invest a little bit more, and then turn around and sell it. Now, it's going to take me a while to do all that work because, you know, it's just going to. i got other things i got to deal with. And we're going to go ahead, though, right off the bat here. And in this video, we're going to get everything out of the way, and we're going to pull that head. We're going to do what we got to do, mark the cams. Um, I'm going to double-check the timing on the cams first just to make sure because I checked them once but I'm going to put it on top dead center make sure that the cam timing was correct ultimately it was when I checked it before and do a little bit more marking on the cams the way I like to do it because the intake and exhaust cams are identical in this you have to mark them to make sure you don't screw them up and then we are going to take the head off and that'll be in this video and we're going to take a look at it may not be able to tear it down in this video but we are going to pull this head and so that's where it unfortunately it left him and becomes ours ours my situation all right now i'm not going to change anything on this i i think he did a nice job on this and none of this is i'm not going to change anything i mean i'm I, i'm i think i'm going to change these out to amber because blue lights in florida are illegal on anything except a, a law enforcement vehicle or other authorized vehicle doesn't matter if they're flashing or not they are illegal, front or rear. We can put red and we can put amber. I think I'm just going to switch these out to red, but we'll keep this plate, which is where a tag goes on. I probably am not going to register this. Uh, not going to. There's no need. I mean, my, once I get it done, we'll take it for a shake around a block or something. People drive vehicles illegally up around here all the time, ATVs and so forth. And, you know, as long as you're not an asshole, it's not a big deal. And so uh, we'll, we'll take it for a test drive, but I seriously doubt I'm going to tag this. Again, I did transfer the title, though. I always do that. My rule is whenever you buy a motorcycle, you transfer the title before you spend one dime on it as far as repairs. 
because if there's a title problem, Florida is real nitpicky about titles. So you got to get that done first. Even though it's an upfront expense that you try to recoup later on, you got to get it done. Because if you take a title and try to do a pass through, then you go to sell it and there's a title problem, then you got not only the purchase price of the bike involved, but whatever you put into it to repair it could have a substantial amount of money on a motorcycle that you can't sell. So yeah, we got that done and you already know what we're going to do. So uh, this is kind of a rather lengthy intro, I know, but I really wanted to explain everything to you so you understood. And, and I, you know, I really want to make one thing really clear. In no way was I trying to bamboozle this guy and say, oh, it's going to cost you a million dollars to fix this thing. Why don't you just sell it to me? I really wanted to get this back to him. And I want him to have this. If I can figure out a way to not completely lose my shirt, and if I could afford it, I'd fix it and give it to the guy and say, you love this bike? I want to make you happy. Unfortunately, I can't afford that. You know, if I had a channel that I was getting 290,000 views per video, I could probably afford to do something like that. But unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do that. I got to get something out of it. So the longer it takes me to repair this, the greater the possibility that the previous owner is going to be able to buy it back, even if we do some sort of a deal with payments or something. Like I said, I, I don't want to keep this. I have no desire to keep this whatsoever. All I'm interested in, like I am in, interested in everything, is to take really cool old bikes like this, and this isn't terribly old, but old still, make them run good, make, turn, you know, make them right, and make them safe, and then sell to somebody who really will get into it and enjoy it. All right. So I am not going to accept anybody who says um, you, you bamboozled this guy and you told him a, a line. You guys know me. I don't play those bullshit games. So if there's anybody out there that even suspects that, you can put that to bed because that's not that is not the case. Um, I really wanted to get this back to him and get it into good running shape. Um, but unfortunately, he just couldn't come up with even the um, money at that time to compensate for the parts I had into it. And this is the only way I'm going to be able to get anything out of it ultimately. And I can't over overemphasize this. I hope it's him or hope it's he that can buy it back. That's my number one goal. That's what I'm going to try to do. But for now, we're going to go ahead and set you up. Now that I've gone through all this uh, rigmarole on this video, you probably already turned it off. Um, and we're, we're going to pull the head. We'll get the tank off. Got the seat off, obviously, already. We'll uh, pull the carbs, set them aside. All right, I'm going to go ahead and wrestle these carbs off. And we got to pull the coils, my nice dyna, dyna coils I put on this job. And get those out of the way and make this all clear. And then we got to pull the head cover. All right, guys, I hope the fan noise isn't too much. I'll try to speak up a little bit just in case it is. Uh, exhaust is off. We had a little snafu with that because the bolt that goes through here, here it is right there. Let me dig it up. Uh, was stripped out on the threads of the nut. There's a, it's a nutted bolt, and so it would just spin, so I had to cut it off from the front. So I put some uh, carbon fiber, like well cloth up in here because the sparks were shooting that way. Cut it off, drove it out, no big deal. So that was dumb. That took a little, you know, not dumb. It was, that was done, rather. Dumb. And uh, got that taken care of. Had to take the crash bar off, drop the exhaust all the way. We're just going to leave it there for now. We will get it out of the way eventually because this ain't staying on the lift for long. i uh, got to get back on some other stuff. Uh, I haven't told you guys this yet, but the Z1R is on the road. Uh, the owner's got it now. And it's coming back in, and I'll show you it at that point. Um, but we're going to be mocking up for some, um, uh, oh, what, what are they called? Maguire wheels, some wider wheels, and a wider swing arm in the back. We're going to be doing some mock up, and that's going to be soon. So, this is really just going to be tear down diagnostics, do some measurements, make sure it's got stock bore, and then I'm going to go online and order parts. But where I was taking you at this point was. I did verify the timing marks are good. Now these are not the previous timing marks. I erased those by with hitting some brake clean on a rag. But these are correct. There's the arrow. You can kind of see it's highlighted now in my white. I use appliance paint, a little brush, you know, a little touch-up thing. Works really well. 
and I, you know, labeled it E for, you know, everything. And then H, I mean I for intake. And so these marks are fine. And you can also tell it by, you can tell that rather, by the fact that when you look at these cams, the lobes on number one, when it's a number one top dead center, would be exactly opposite, opposite each other, right? And these are, it looks like it isn't because of the thickness of the gasket. These are exactly opposite. We look at the timing marks from the other side though. But if we had number four top dead center, if we went 360 degrees, uh, number four would be the same way with the, um, uh, with the lobes pointing away from each other. So now that we know that this is good, um, I'm gonna rescribe some lines long as it lines up to that arrow see this side lines up really well because it's the untensioned side so we can score uh, go right across the top of the head cover surface and then put a uh, nice little scribe mark in there just on the paint this it didn't quite dry yet but good enough yeah there we are there we are and it, you know it's just for reference because I'm gonna see the arrows anyway but it's just what I like to do so don't get all, you know, hootenannied up if your exhaust uh, cam is exactly right in, when, in a bike like this and other ones similar to this. Your intake side looks a little off because remember there's a tensioner on, technically a rub on the top of the head cover that would actually kind of turn, clock that backwards a little bit. Which is why you defeat this tensioner, the wedge in the tensioner, before you put the head cover on. Because right now it would tension this out and it would the wedge would go in a little further because it would think you know it's like okay I got a little chain slack but you really don't and you put that head cover down it, it, it would be straight across and you keep pushing and pushing you can damage your chain so you defeat that by taking the wedge out or whatever type of tensioner you got and then um, this thing will boing boing up and down no problem because it's just going against the spring the wedge locks it in place so that's what we're going to do next we're going to take the tensioner out completely and then I got to review the literature um, on the sequence to take the cams out as far as the bolt removal goes. I know there's a sequence, but I can't remember it. Of course, the climber manual basically sucks. It doesn't give a procedure, but we're just going to go easy and do each one uh, nice and even, crosswise. Go from one side to the other. Start with one cam, a cam and then do the other. There are alignment dowel pins in here so when you take these out don't don't let them fall in the motor or something pin removal tool yeah we'll just shove that cam out of the way i want to get this pin out shove it there we are that's how you get these out. You get one of these sets. You don't have to worry about the chain right now because there's another cam in here still. But pretty soon we're going to be tying it up with some mechanics wire. Okay, let me do that. Let me get the exhaust cam out. We'll tie this up with some mechanics wire. Then we'll start um, disengaging some head hardware. So uh, the, the general rule here on removing heads is uh, you start from the opposite of a torquing sequence, which is generally from the outside in, because a torquing sequence is going to be in from the inside is going to be from the inside out. Uh, even that piece of crap Chilton manual should have uh, a sequence for torquing, so we're just going to reverse that, and I'll start breaking these fasteners down, taking them off a little bit at a time, till we get them loose, and then we'll break the head loose and get it off. I uh, got them all out. The washers are all out except these crush washers over here. These things are usually stuck till you get this thing moving. Oh, I got to take these guys out. These are loose, but I forgot to remove the um, M6s on the ends here. Doi. Trying a little bit more. Oh, yeah. The whole base gasket's moving. That's unusual. Not. All I want is the head. Yeah, usually the base gaskets got this thing down there, has got this thing uh, cemented on there. Let me get you out of the way so I can get a little better swing at it. Well, that's weird. I don't like prying, but it's working just 
gentle, like get it rocking. So you can break off these uh, fins real easy. And we don't want to do that, but it's moving now. There it goes. Okay. I got oil. It's like we've struck oil. Black gold, Texas tea. What helps hold it is these damn crush washers, but they're almost impossible to get out before you start moving the head. All right, now, see if I could, ugh, this is gonna come, okay, so. Now this is what I do at least. You know I have this tied up here. Well, you really don't need to tie it up if it's long enough. You just tie it together and just let it sit in there. I just tied it up there, force of habit, really. So you just let your wire just sit here, like that. Push it down in even, it don't matter. It ain't going nowhere. And then just pull your head off. Ah. Oh, come on, you. There it goes. Ah. Ah. See, now you got your thing here and you really got to worry about it. I mean, it's, it's not going anywhere. I mean, once you get the head off, you could reach in there and grab it anyway. But, you know, it's good practice to put a wire on it anyway. All right, so um, we have a uh, traditional two-piece head gasket, three-piece really, and that's got the one on each side and then the rubber one in the middle. And these certainly look like the stock bore. What is that, 70 mil? I think it's 60 or 70, I don't remember which. Yeah, 60, I don't know. And uh, i got to verify that. Right off the bat, cylinders don't look too bad. Let's look at number two and three. Then we're going to look at the head. We're going to get some head. Well, there is a little, let me zoom you up. There's a little nastiness down in there. Light, uh, the uh, camera, the phone does not like an LED light. You kind of see that line? Probably where it was sitting for a while. But, you know, not, I don't see any significant vertical scoring. I don't know, it just might be a little staining. Yeah, take a look at number two. See if we can get you in a little bit better. The two is looking a little rough. See how, let me turn the light on on the phone and see if it'll help. I mean, it's not terrible, per se. I think it looks a lot worse than it is. I hardly even feel anything, so it might be more like staining. You know where it was sitting. See, you got some crud up in there. Now I feel that. That'll clean up with a ball hone, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, can't really say there's much of a ridge. But, yeah. Not bad. Um, uh, if one and four are the same, uh, we're going to be definitely be able, definitely be able to work with this one. With this jug. And you know me, I love my jugs. We've got our O-rings that go in there, because remember, the, your oil passages are actually part of this, as far as the oil coming up. Pretty sure this side's a drain, but this side's definitely pressure, and then of course your uh, center section. But uh, yeah, so yeah, you, you know what I mean. You get it, because you know you got your pressure section being the oil gallery there. So yep, all right, stand by. We're gonna hold the chain, Allison chains, so it kind of can move because we gotta bar the motor over. Oh, I got the wrong socket in there, dummy. Actually, I got the wrong ratchet. Just kind of hold it there and. You can kind of feel it uh, move. You just don't want it to bind up. Let it slide between your slimy fingers. All right. The other thing I wanted to check was to make sure they're even. I'm going to bring one and four back up in a minute. Make sure this crank ain't twisted. Sure don't look at it on two and four. That looks nice. I actually didn't pay any attention to it when I just rotated it. Kind of interested in the cylinders, the bores. Oh man, there's a lot of oil on number one up in here. But that could be coming down from taking the head off. But the, the cylinder or the piston itself looks very wet. But the bore looks nice. Number four. This is, I tell you right now, this will clean up no problem with a ball home. You see how glazed they are? Look how glazed they are. I mean, these cylinder walls, you, you get a little bit of suggestion of some cross hatching just a little tiny tiny bit unless that's a fig newton in my imagination but 
those things are glazed. I mean, wicked glazed. So, uh, these will clean up with a ball hone. If they're within spec, or at least close within spec to the pistons as far as the board of piston clearance, uh, I'm not going to really worry about it. We'll, uh, we'll shoot a ball hone in there and prep them for new rings and clean everything up and throw new rings in, and this, this will be good. The head is what I'm concerned about. Let's look at that now. Okay, four, three, two, one. Four is, uh, I mean, these, these look like, these look terrible. Let me get you a light. Wow. I mean, they're just, they do not look healthy. Look at that, that, mar that margin actually might be just, um, you know, uh, carbon buildup instead of damage. Because it looks like damage from inside the uh, bore scope when I looked at it. But, whew, full of carbon. Terrible. That can also impact your compression readings, too. Takes up space. Usually not that much, but this is awfully thick. I mean, there's a lot of carbon in there. Now, what I'm really interested to do here is let's go ahead and at least take one valve out on the intake side and see what um, it looks like. I'll just go get my valve compressor tool and we'll just take that one out. It's a Motion Pro valve compressing tool. Uh, 80-0641 is the number on it, right there, little tiny letters. It is a great tool, it works very well. I use it, um, you know, whenever I gotta do valves. I can't say I use it all the time. Both sides are adjustable, so you gotta kinda figure it out first, which, which uh, place to put it, as far as the adjustability goes. I'm gonna do number one intake. There we go. Push that down. I got a little magnet that I use for this poipus to get the keepers out. Jeepers creepers. Where'd you get those keepers? Sometimes these are progressive. Yeah, so the the winding is tighter at the bottom, so that goes down. We'll have to keep that in mind. Alright, so we got the spring out. And that's the bore of course that the spring sits in. And you can see your seal down inside there. You know, it's a little dark, sorry. And then we'll just pop... Th this valve is, is loose in here. I mean, around the seal for sure. Let me wiggle the valve back and forth. It's really not that bad. I, mean, I get a little bit of movement there, but it ain't terrible. There's your valve, number one. Intake. Get the seal off. Just grab them with a pick tool. Usually they come off pretty easy. Ugh. Not... Well, that, uh, that particular... Valve guy doesn't look too bad. So, wonder if my theory is bunk. Probably is. Yeah, there's some play in there. Could be. You know what? Let's look at it from the other side. Well, here's number two intake. I took them both out. I don't really see anything right off the bat that's terrible. I mean, there's definitely some play in here. All right, there's definitely some play. And I think it's quite a bit. In fact, two is real bad. So I would wager that both the guides and the, the valves, probably both, are scrap because there's a lot of wear on number two here. If you got too much slop in here, that would cause a lot of our problems. And uh, the seals are shot too, so you know there's a lot of movement in here. So yeah, um, I'm still going with valve guides and or valves. Um, the valve face though, you know, the seat rather, well the seats are on the other side, the face, they look pretty damn good. Like somebody's actually lapped them at some point. I don't know, they look pretty good, but these are really worn. Um, I don't have time to mic them up right now, but once I take them all apart and organize them, I'll sit down at Dad's old bench, we'll go through the service manual, we'll mic everything up and do a little tiny bore gauge and check the guides. I, I'm going to bet my bottom dollar that these guides are scrap, so the valves, the valves probably need to be replaced, and then um, take it from there. Okay, folks, this is where we're at. I took some time today, the next day, and I went through and stripped the whole head. Now, I want to do some testing on this real quick and show you what I found as far as the valves go. Uh, number one, I don't really see a big smoking gun like I was hoping I'd see in regards to the valve guides um, or the clearances or anything like that, but they are definitely worn, definitely. 
So what I did was I just took number two here. This is, um, you know, flipped around. Number two as an example, and I have the two um, intake valve set and two exhaust over here. I keep everything organized. And what I did was the rocking method for valve guide clearance. Um, the intake valve is, um, let's see, what is that? Um, about nine and a half thou for that. And on the in, on the exhaust side, it's about eight and a half, so roughly and nine and a half for intake, eight and a half for um, exhaust. So what I found in the intake was it's probably closer to ten, maybe nine. So you know it's kind of hard for me to do. I don't really have a good flat button indicator, so I have to really hold things as steady as possible and move it back and forth. But I got some readings that were upwards of closer to ten thou. The exhaust side is definitely, definitely 10 thou, maybe 11. Um, it's flickering back and forth quite a bit. Now, generally speaking, they don't give you a depth of how far to put the valve in to do this. Other manuals do, but this one doesn't. So I use the old standby of bringing the valve down to where it's flush with the end of the uh, valve guide um, and then just hold it there. Do a classic reach around, hold it at that point, and then move it back and forth. It's, it's a reference, all right? You can tell on the intake valves, in particular, as far as valve wear goes, that uh, the shafts, you said shaft, are, are freaking really worn. Look at that shiny part. And when you mic that up, you get at least a half, if not three-quarter of a thou difference between the areas that aren't worn like that. Uh, the valve faces on the uh, valve itself are not bad for the intake side and nor is the seats too terribly bad. They're not great, but they're not terribly bad. But if you look at the exhaust, this is again number two. Um, these are really terrible. There is no freaking way this thing was sealing up too well under compression, which is what the point I was getting to. When, when you have good compression readings, they can be skewed by oil coming in. And uh, that's what I think was really happening on this. Uh, the, the other telltale sign was when you take the valve keepers out, the valves just fall out because the seals are so worn. I mean, there's like no friction hardly on the seals to the to the valves themselves, the valve stems, and so you know you're getting oil past that. But as far as anything jumping out at me that would cause like a huge, huge vacuum leak or something on the intake side, I can't honestly say that I found it. What I also did was I took a small penis, a uh, small um, tool like this. So you said tool, which are small hole bore, you know, gauges, small bore, small hole gauges. And I've uh, I've been measuring up the intakes in particular. And when you run this down the intake from either side, the center is larger than the ends. Now that could be a little bit of carbon, but not up toward the top. So the center of these guys is wore out. And I guess that sort of makes sense uh you know the, the the guides are definitely wore out definitely they're not out of spec because the problem with these ma old manuals and this i think i called it a chilton before these climber manuals basically suck they only give you wear limits the maximum they don't really give you any ranges a couple things they do like the piston ring installed gap is a range which is nice Otherwise, it's maximum. It's essentially a scrap or a, you know, just like Briggs and Stratton does. It's, it gives you a, um, a scrap uh, uh, measurement and that's it. And that's all really this is, is maximum wear limits. So if you do the um, valve stem or a valve guide ID rather, the wear limit's 279 Imperial uh, or 7.08 millimeters. Now, these are not at that point, but the way they feel, um, I'm thinking that they are no good as well. So it would be foolish to put this back together like with just new valves. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I've already ordered the parts. I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to replace all the valve um, uh, guides, valve guides, and the valves. We'll do the uh, installed valve um, height uh, measurement. I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to do that yet with a depth mic but I'm gonna make something to help me. I'm not gonna buy any more tools. But what I also ordered was, I ordered everything I need to do the valve guides properly by getting them out, putting them back in, and then recutting the seats. I've always wanted a, um, a really nice, you know, K 
kit for cutting seats if I need to. And so I finally pulled the trigger on one. It was wicked expensive, but I ordered it for the general purpose Japanese motorcycles. Comes with all the different pilots, including 7 mil, which is what these are. And I ordered all the parts um, from Z1 Enterprises for, you know, the, the replacement uh, bronze um, something or other uh, valve guides and all the new valves and no no new springs or nothing like that and of course a full top end kit as far as the gaskets and so forth goes so we're gonna i've never done this before so we're gonna try it in house and i've been researching it and i think we should be able to do it i don't have the air impact type to go down and brrr, you know with an air impact gun like a chis air chisel gun uh, you can buy those so we're going to probably just either drift them or figure out a way to press them. You know, of course, they're in an angle, so you'd have to have an angle plate. That may be too much of a job to fabricate. So, yeah, I'm going to research how to do this. I know that the exhaust side in particular, these ends have to be really, really clean. So they really need to be blasted, but I don't think we're going to be able to do that. This has got to be a budget job, budget build. But we also don't want to scrap the head or have to go oversize on the... Um, on the valve guides, which you can, they have up to four thou oversized. So I'm gonna clean these up best I can, and I think I can because I have a really nice, um, uh, you know, wire th wheel dealio. We can put it in a high RPM and get in here and knock this off pretty good, and uh, then we'll we'll drive them out. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to do that yet. Like I said, I'm I'm new to this as well, but you know, I've said it more than once. Um, if Alan Milliard can do what he does in a garden shed, we can certainly do this here. So I wanted to tell you one other thing about the bike that I failed to do so before as I close this video out. Um, I, if you recall from video number one where I was talking to the previous owner about the history of it, what he thought the history of it was, he kept referencing a place called Hollywood Motors and said that this place allegedly um, uh, sells or leases um, you know, motorcycles and things like that to the movie industry. And he felt that this was likely a stunt bike or maybe in a movie appearance in a movie or a TV show or something like that. But we couldn't validate that. Well, I haven't validated it either. But what I did do is I've spent some time, I spent some time rather on, um, I was going to say eBay. Why was I going to say that? Spent some time on the Google machine. And I did find uh, a, a hit on a website well, not really a website. They don't have a website. Uh, I hit on a Yelp um, uh, profile, actually, for a company called Hollywood Motors Corporation, or Incorporated. I think it's Hollywood Motors Corporation. Because if you just do Hollywood Motors, it's all over the country. Hollywood, Florida, there's one, maybe more. Um, you know, as far as Hollywood, California goes, you know, you get, you get more hits outside of that state than you do inside the state if you just simply Google Hollywood Motors. But I googled Hollywood Motors um, movie motorcycles or movie vehicles or motorcycles. This place deals with um, buying surplus police motorcycles for, I guess, their main gig. And, and on their Yelp, and they don't have a website, but some pictures and references on there, you, they have some on, on those particular sites that show a bunch of BMW police bikes and things like that that they get from wherever. I don't know where they get them from. And so it's highly likely that those people are the ones that this previous owner got that from. Where he got that story, was it from them? I don't know. So what I did was, since they don't have email or, or I don't even, I think they have a phone number, but it was too lengthy to give them a call. I wrote them a letter, an actual letter that you put a stamp on and put it in the mailbox. And I explained what I what I wanted to find out. I gave him a brief history of what's going on as far as where I'm at in its ownership and what the previous owner told me and see if they can confirm any of this. See if they can give me some sort of, um, you know, history. See where they actually got it from. You know, I, I provide the VIN number, but the previous owner, um, uh, according to the Florida title data, uh, got this in 2018, so that's five years. So I don't know if they're going to actually have those records, but I'm hopeful that somebody there will probably know or maybe know something about it or remember it. And I gave them as much detail as possible with the exception of photos. I mean, they probably couldn't use a photo on it, especially since it's been kind of doctored up or changed. 
And yeah, um, so I will report back if I find any more information on this thing as far as its background. I just wanted to mention that before I close the video out. Next video, we're going to be getting into the cylinder part. We'll do some uh, evaluation of that. And then, um, uh, as I said, I've already ordered the rings. I haven't even mic'd it up yet, and I ordered just standard rings because it's a 69 and a half bore. It, it is standard. Uh, my Mr. Scale says it is, at least, you know, metric scale. So I ordered the standard stuff, and we're going to go ahead and just do our normal in-house stuff on that as well. Run a hone through the ball hone, prep them up, clean up the pistons, put new rings on, clock them, do the ring end gap if necessary, fall back together, do the head in house as I've already described, get it back together and see how it runs. It's going to take a while for me to get to that. I'm going to have to pull this off the lift soon, go back to not only uh, a couple other jobs, but the Z1R, mocking up that swing arm I was talking about, and some other stuff. This is just kind of to get us down that road. So if you want to see more on this, you need to stick around, subscribe, ring the bell. Uh, like the video, it helps my analytics, and of course share. So that closes this one out. Thanks for watching. Catch you on the next video.